So when you got um, to America and were immersed in the process of making house, I mean, it's a relentless schedule, isn't it? And it's a completely different way of working in many ways. Totally to, different, to yeah. Describe the difference, actually. Well, first of all, they work... Americans work so hard, it makes your nose bleed. It's just extraordinary. They are... Um, I remember going to work, I would go on, on a motorcycle every morning and I would probably sort of five o'clock in the morning I was going to work. All the lights were on. Shops were opening up, offices, lights were coming on. People on treadmills through wind. You know, there's a sort of furious desire to get on, to work incredibly long hours and never to let go until, until you've accomplished whatever it is. Um, How did a, you feel about embracing that? Well, that actually happened to suit my Presbyterian uh, soul. I quite like that, actually. Um, I also took some pride in being able to, you know, keep up and not, uh, and not start uh, wilting uh, before we got to the end of the day, you know. But it was, it was relentless, and it was, um, there was an awful lot of it. You know, because they do every, everything, it's a big country. Everything they do is, is bigger. And if they have a show that they like, the idea of doing six of them, that sort of... Or at least back then, it's, it's, it's changed a lot now. Uh, people are starting, broadcasters are starting to do, you know, six of something or ten of something uh, instead of... 700. 700, yeah, yeah. Well, tell me about your relationship with Dr. Gregory Hess. I mean, as a character, what was it that you, that you engaged with about him? I mean, you did the American accent so brilliantly. Americans must think you're American, don't they? Oh, I, I don't. I don't know about that. I mean, well, first of all, I think uh, I, there may be some Americans here. Maybe a lot of Americans here. Do you I don't think know. He's American? Americans. First of all, Americans don't do a very good American accent. Um, <laughs> I've done. Um, and so I'm constantly having to correct it. Um, <laughs> but they're also because they're much less interested. In, they, they don't have the Professor Higgins ear for. Uh, you know, class and background and geography and the, the way that the British are much more attuned to, wait a second, where are you from and who do, what trick are you trying to pull on me by, with that particular choice of words? Um, I think partly because, um, it, again, because it's such a big country, nobody really, it doesn't bother people so much where you're from or, or why you sound the way you sound. A America's a country that's too big to know itself. Someone living in Florida has got no idea what, how people behave or what they eat or how they dress in Oregon. It's, it's just so far away. Whereas we know, of course, we know absolutely everything about... Every, every, every British drama you watch, you go, wait a minute, that's High Wycombe. <laughs> yeah, I know that. Well, that could never happen, you know, because it's a one-way system there. Um, whereas America is such... It's so mythically grand that it can't know its... It's too big to know itself. And, and that actually has an effect with, with things like things like accent. I also thought that House occupying a sort of, it's a sort of semi-academic world. Academia is, is its own country in a way. There's a certain amount of latitude you're allowed. You can assume that academics, they travel and they practice their, their trade in, in many different parts of the world. So I thought I would, I would probably, I could probably get away with it. But it also required a huge uh, sort of lifestyle change. At a certain point, you decided you had to live there because yeah, the, the yeah. schedule was so the commute, intense. A daily commute was not feasible. Yeah. <laughs> from High Wycombe. Yeah. Um, I, I wondered how it felt, you know, because you're very self-deprecating, as we've already discussed at the beginning of the programme. But, you know, you have lived in America now for a period of time as one of its highest paid, if not the highest paid actor in a, oh, in a US phooey. drama. Um, you know, regarded as one of the most successful Britons to make a, a, transatlantic, a transatlantic career move. Did you feel, did, do you feel any of that? No, uh, not really, <laughs> no, because there was no, there was no, there was sort of no opportunity to, to drink at that particular well. It was a, um, you know, a television uh, or, or a, a, a soundstage is they're pretty much the same wherever you go in the world. It's a big um, barn of a building with no windows. 
and it's got a, a fake set in it, and you eat standing up with uh, plastic forks, and um, suddenly it's time to go home, and then you do, and then repeat. So it's grim out west as well. Well, it's not grim. I don't mean to say it's grim. I mean, it was a, my God, it was a gilded cage, and I loved the people I was doing it with. I loved the, the character. I really did love the character, and still do love the character. Um, and I was incredibly proud of some of the things we did. I thought, no, that's a... That's not just good, I actually, I actually think in a funny way that's important. I think it's important that somebody speaks up for um, truth over sentiment, truth over feeling. Um, because even when House started, it felt like we were about to be uh, drowned in this, this feeling that the world is remakeable in my own head to be what I want it to be. And I can, be, I can, in my own head, I can, you know, I can wish upon a star. Do you think he's a character that could survive in today's climate? You know, the sort of polarized no. climate that you that you you talked about he earlier. Would, he would have been sued so many times over. He would be in prison, <laughs> possibly dead. Uh, you know, possibly a, a gunshot to the back of the head at some point. I I, don't, I can't see. I mean, maybe the medical profession is. Maybe it's the only place where your results, that is to say your ability to solve a problem and bring people back from the dead, which is sort of what he did every week, um, is, the, is the one thing that will allow people to forgive you certain um, aberrations of, of social etiquette. Yes. Well, I think if you're going to, I can't think of any you're going to make sure I live, then I'm probably going to forgive probably you quite I a lot. Probably I will put up with the sarcastic remarks, yeah. <laughs> but what about, if I think it is that those, those medical dramas are so successful, I mean, the house is phenomenal across the globe. Um, obviously ER before it, very, very successful. Um, You've also starred in Chance as, as Dr. Chance, which again, you know, audiences just seem to love the wine. Well, that, yes, I thought of that as a very different thing. The, um, Ch Chance was a, um, was a neuropsychiatrist. I was absolutely fascinated, as I have always long been fascinated by neuroscience, and, and I'm a sort of hoover up any, any pop versions of neuroscience I can get hold of. Um, and I thought there was an absolutely fascinating story to be to be told about the world of uh, neuroscience and neuropsychiatry. Because for this reason, there are, as you know, many, many hundreds of television shows about murder and about apprehending the killer. You know, that's the sort of staple fare of, of most television nowadays, it seems to be, the television drama. This is a stark fact, but, uh, and I feel almost nervous about saying this because it, it feels like I'm tempting fate, but God forbid any of us should happen to die a violent death. We are twice as likely to kill ourselves as be killed by another. No matter what newspapers, no matter how much they may want you to believe that you're gonna be stabbed the moment you step out of your door, it's more likely you're gonna stab yourself. I'm not sure if that's a relief or not. No, well, no, there isn't. <laughs> but it's, but it's, there is, it's just interesting to me that there's not one television show about something that represents literally twice the danger, it, and that is mental illness and suicide and the aberrations that can occur inside the human brain. You know, we are about to, we're gonna have people on Mars in 25 years, and yet we know nothing about what's going on in, uh, between our ears. I well, find Sherlock's that. got issues. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, absolutely, yeah. And, but, but do, is that something that you'd like to do? I mean, is that well, a, another Well, it turns step out you'd one of the things... That you the, are doing it. I, no, no, I'm not, I'm not doing it. But one of, the, one of the obstacles to telling those kinds of stories is uh, this phenomenon that I was only recently made aware of, that you, you basically cannot do drama about suicide. You're not allowed to do it because uh, it, it's, an, it's an imitatable behavior. Um, and there, it's demonstrably true that there are spikes of um, self-harm and, and suicide where you have introduced some notable example of it. Which is why it's such a problem online. And, it's and such so a problem. And, 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 but the fact that it's such a problem doesn't necessarily mean that I think we should just shy away from it. I, I, was, um, I think it's a fascinating area to try and approach, but my God, it's, a, it's one that needs to be approached with the utmost delicacy and skill yeah. and, and compassion, obviously.